going to take some time this morning to celebrate the kindness and goodness of God. Because it's the kindness and goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's His graciousness, His compassion, His mercy that draws us to Him. And we're going to celebrate that this morning. Let's sing You Are Good. Everybody, you can take your seats just for a few moments. Just want to pray, and then we'll just share with you some announcements for uh, the incoming week. Father, we just thank you for your presence with us this morning, and we thank you, Father, for that amazing truth that you are good. And we thank you that you're good all of the time. And Lord, we just pray that, Lord, even as we've come together this morning, that truth, oh God, would penetrate our hearts and penetrate our lives afresh this morning that we would grasp again, Lord, how good you are, how amazing you are, how loving you are, how faithful you are this morning. And so we just welcome you, Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to our hearts through a time of worship. And you'll minister uh, to our hearts, Lord, even as Matthew would share this morning about the work in Moldova and Ukraine. And so, Father, we just pray that you would come, Holy Spirit, 
and minister to our hearts even now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our service this morning and welcome to those who are watching online. Just some uh, announcements for the incoming week. We want to welcome Matthew Hillier. Matthew will come in and sharing a little later on regarding the work in Moldova and Ukraine. On Monday, uh, on Monday we have our Hope Uniform Bank at 10 till 12 in the morning and 6.30 to 8 p.m. in the evening. Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. is our prayer hub that is beginning back. And then on Saturday, the prayer breakfast also is beginning back as well. Um, next Sunday morning, Pastor Bill again will be with us and he will be continuing on in the summer series, The Journeys of Faith. Uh, just to let you know that Jeff is on holidays, so if I can put it lovely and kindly, please don't contact him. Okay, he's on holidays, he needs to rest, he needs to be refreshed. So Pastor Bill and myself is here. If any issues arise, please um, uh, don't be afraid to contact us. So I'm going to invite Rebecca. Rebecca's going to come and share. She wants to do it down there. There you are. Calling me out. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to give a quick reminder for our Holiday Bible Club that is happening this week. It is called I Wonder, and it is on from Wednesday evening to Friday evening, starting at 6.30 to 7.30, with registration beginning from 6.15. Um, it is for those kids who are going into P1 and those kids who are going into P7, okay, just for a wee bit of clarification. Um, I also have some registration forms at the reception desk. Um, so if you have your kids along this morning, please do grab one and fill it out because it makes things a wee bit easier on the night. Um, sorry, I have a list so I don't forget everything. Uh, yes, the coffee shop will also be open during our holiday Bible club. So any parents or guardians who are dropping their kids off can make use of that to grab a cup of tea or coffee and a catch up. Um, and also on Saturday, the 6th of August at half 12, we are having a picnic at Hillsborough Forest Park and everybody is welcome to that, okay? Not just those who are going to the Holy Bible Club, but it is open to everyone. So please come along and um, we are meeting at 12.30. Um, there's also a sign-up sheet for that at reception, um, just so we know numbers for tea and coffee. Um, and also a quick announcement about Kingdom Kids then. It will be back during the month of August for a more relaxed program. So just to let you know, the kids will go out as normal um, just before the sermon. And Kingdom Kids will officially be back in September. Um, but it's exciting because we have lots of newbie ones coming because they're starting P1. But because of that, I am really, 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 really in need of some more leaders to help us out. Um, we are just about meeting our child protection ratios. Um, this past year, um, I've had to grab quite a few people out of church last minute um, just to cover our numbers. So if you're able to help, please do let me know. Um, if you're not able to take part in the program, even just being there in the room is a massive help. Um, it truly is an amazing time. And I know if you talk to any of the leaders here, it really is incredible. Um, your kids are amazing. Um, how much they know God and know his word and worship and pray is incredible. So you're really, really missing out if you don't come along. Um, let me just check. I've got everything. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, shall we stand again together? Let's continue our time of worship.
Welcome him as our Lord this morning. Welcome him as the center of our lives today because it is all about Jesus this morning. No matter what your journey is this morning, it's all about him. It's him being the center of your life this morning. It's him being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's him being in control of all things, overseeing all things, 
working in all things for his glory, for his honor this morning. We just thank God for these just two songs. It helps us to refocus. Helps us to refocus this morning. Even in this holiday season, it helps us to refocus Jesus to be the center of our lives. Him to be Lord of everything. Him to have free reign in our lives, to work and move as he wants to work and he wants to move this morning. Father, we just worship you for this moment. We just thank you for these two songs this morning that have enabled us just to, at this point in the service, refocus our hearts and our lives on you. And so, Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come, and just minister afresh to us this morning, enable us to refocus our hearts, enable us to refocus our lives, enable us, Lord, to set aside the things that are maybe distracting us at the moment, and allow you, O God, to become the center of our lives, allow you to be King of kings and Lord of lords this morning. So, Father, I just pray that you would move right across the congregation, right across our hearts, right across our lives this morning. But at this moment, we will just take that opportunity just to center our lives on you, center our thoughts on you this morning, that you will come and you will move, Lord, afresh, Lord, across all our lives. In Jesus' name I ask it, Father. Just worship you, Lord. Just worship you. Just honor you this morning. We just praise you this morning. It's great to have Matthew with us. Uh, Matthew's going to come and share. Let's welcome Matthew as he shares this morning. <laughs> Well, it's a real uh, a joy to be with you this morning, and I thank you for the opportunity uh, to come and uh, share with you a little bit about the work that uh, God is doing in uh, the little country of Moldova and also in neighbouring Ukraine, and uh, we've been really so excited over the last 12 months to see the way that the Lord is working there in the lives of people and how He's changing lives and how people are coming to know the Lord Jesus as their Saviour, and it's really a joy for us to uh, have the privilege of being involved in the work that the Lord is doing there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but before I do that, um, I just wanted to read a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And then the, at the end, after I have uh, given the report, I'd just like to share a few thoughts from this passage. So if you could turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Matthew 14. And we'll just read from verse 22. And we've just been singing that it's all about the Lord Jesus. And this story is a little bit like that as well. It's all about the Lord Jesus. So Matthew 14, verse 22. And it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you... Command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, 
Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Well, may God bless his word to us this morning. Well, as I said, I'd like to uh, just share a little bit about um, the work that we're involved in in Moldova. Um, the organisation, as you can see there, it's CMI Aid, which uh, you probably may guess stands for Christian Mission International Aid. And uh, we live in Moldova, which is a little country uh, in Eastern Europe, a little bit more well known now because of all that's been going on in Ukraine. So it's that little country that is sort of wedged between Romania and Ukraine. And as you probably guess, um, I originally don't come from the UK or from Northern Ireland, uh, but from a fair way away, Sydney in Australia. And I got involved in the work um, probably in a bit of an unusual way because um, I went to a Christian school in, in Sydney, which I'm very thankful for. And there was a, a, a man who was working at the school who used to drive one of the buses and he used to be involved in an organisation you've probably heard of called the Slavic Gospel Association. And at that time, when I was at school quite some time ago now, um, it was still part of the Soviet Union in these countries. Communism still existed in that, well, still exists now, but it was still the ruling force in those countries. And uh, he started to talk to me about some of the Christians who were being persecuted in those Soviet countries. And one day he came... And I was in year seven at the time, and he said to me, uh, would you be interested to write some letters to some of these Christians who are in prison? He said, you know, if you write to them, if you decide to do this, he said, I don't know whether they will get your letters. He said, probably they'll be confiscated. But he said, at least the authorities will know that Christians around the world know about the, situations, the situation of Christians in the Soviet Union. And so I started writing uh, some letters to these addresses that he gave me. Of course, I couldn't write Russian, which was uh, the main language. So he gave me some phrases in Russian, like, we're praying for you, and we know, that, know about you, and some Bible verses. And he said, just, you know, carefully copy it out onto a postcard or a letter, send it to these people. And he said, maybe they'll get it, but if not, he said, at least the authorities will know that you know about the situation there. And so this was in 1988, and in 1989, of course, everything started to change in that part of the world. Uh, some of you who can remember that period of time would remember those two very famous words, glasnost and perestroika, which was to do with the new freedoms that Gorbachev was bringing in at that time. And, of course, as a result of this, a lot of these Christian people, or all of them who were imprisoned, were allowed to go back to where they had come from. And one man in particular who I'd been writing to a few times and I'd never received a reply from him, his name was Nikolai and he came from Odessa in Ukraine and uh, he got home from his exile in Siberia and when he got home he wrote a letter and he said, um, I received your letters while I was in prison, I couldn't write to you, but he said, now I've been released and he said, it's wonderful because I've come back to Odessa. And he said, in the prayer house here, there's 200 Christians. And he said, all through this period of persecution, the church has been able to continue. And he said, God is blessed. Uh, he said, and we're so thankful for the fact that we can be together again. But he said, one of the problems is that uh, among us as Christians, 200 of us, we have one Bible. And he said, I was wondering whether you'd be able to find any Bibles or New Testaments in Russian or Ukrainian uh, in Australia and where you live and send them to us because we need them for the church and we need them for the work of the gospel here in uh, the Soviet Union as it still was at that time. And so I was able to find some and sent them across. Uh, he received them. Of course, he wrote back then and he said, look, we've got the Bibles, but we need more. Can you send more? And so that's how I got involved in the work in Eastern Europe, sending literature across. Then we started to send containers uh, then started to travel, of course, to these countries in Eastern Europe. And then um, in 2011, had the uh, wonderful blessing of meeting Ruth. Well, actually, I met her before that, but Ruth was working in Armenia and where we visited and we got married. And then in 2000 and the end of 2011, we went to live in uh, Moldova. 
and we've been there ever since. So we have three little boys, Sam, Ben and Josh. Um, we really thank the Lord for them. Um, but just we, we give thanks to God, you know, for the privilege that he has given us to be in that country. Because Moldova, we believe, is a very special, a unique place at the moment uh, in Eastern Europe. Because uh, Moldova is very open to the gospel. And it's wonderful to see that. You can go to the schools, you can go to the police, you can go to the fire stations, and I'll share about some of those places in a moment. And generally speaking, people are very open to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we praise God, you know, for those open doors of opportunity at the moment. You can see a map up on the screen. You can see Ukraine and Romania there. And down in the southern part of the country, a region called the Kahul region, and that's uh, where we live uh, in a little village uh, called Zanesht. Um, I wanted to just tell you a little background to the country, though, because Moldova is still considered to be the poorest country in Europe. And so it has a small population, um, officially about 3.2 million people, but about 700,000 or maybe up to a million people live outside the country. They go to different countries to work. So it's probably closer to 2.2 million people. And recently, because of the crises in Ukraine, uh, the population has swelled by about half a million people. And I'll tell you a little bit about that situation later. But as a result of this, of course, many, many people in Moldova live in very, very poor conditions. You can see a few photos here. Uh, these are some of the homes that we visit of families, elderly people, um, those who are sick. And of course, you know, the needs are tremendous uh, among these people in Moldova. And so some of the first work that we got involved in when we went to Moldova in 2010 was to set up a soup kitchen work. And the idea of this ministry was to go out each day uh, to take hot meals to some of these people and, of course, to help them practically. But we praise God that through that, he opened the door to be able to share the gospel with these people uh, in their homes. And so we continue to do that uh, every day. We take hot meals to these people and we have a number of workers who are involved in that ministry. Most of the people who receive help through this work um, are elderly people, but also some families as well. Because many families really struggle in Moldova, particularly at the present time uh, with the situation. And you can see a little boy here who's one of the children who receives hot meals and how happy uh, they were to receive um, that sort of help. And so, you know, there's many, many um, impoverished people still in that country. Of course, not everybody is in situations like that. And, you know, there's many people who live in very good conditions as well. But we try, you know, where we have the opportunity to provide help to some of these needy families in that country. But back in 2000 and uh, 12, uh, the Lord enabled us to buy this uh, building in the village of Zanesht. And it was actually an old apartment block. And when we bought it, um, it was totally abandoned. It was nothing inside. Um, it's uh, 49 apartments. In, uh, it was built with 49 apartments. And we were looking to build a building in the village to set up you know, various ministries there. And so we went to a local construction company and we were speaking to them about what we wanted to do. And he said, the man there said, look, you know, really the best is if you can find a building which can be renovated for your use, it'll be much, much more uh, cost effective to do that. And he said, actually, in your village, there's this apartment block and maybe this would be suitable for you. And we hadn't even really noticed it. It's funny, in a, a, a five-storey building and we hadn't really noticed it there because it was so derelict. And, but anyway, after we saw him, we went and we visited this building um, it was nothing inside, it was just an empty concrete shell. But as we walked around, we could see, you know, how this could be used for God's work there in that area. And so we approached the local council, we spoke to them, and they said they were happy to sell it to us. Uh, and they said, you know, how much can you pay? And we said, well, we have this amount of money, which was not much, about uh, 80,000 euro. And uh, someone had given this specifically to buy a building there. And so we said, this is what we have. And they said, well, look, this building has to go to auction because it's a, a government building. But what we'll do is we'll get the valuation done and we'll auction it at the price of the valuation. And so the valuation came back and guess what it was? It was 80,000 euro for this building. And so it went to auction and nobody else 
bid it on the building and so we got it and then we're able to start the work on renovating it to use for the Lord's work there in Moldova. And so we thank the Lord, you know, for the amazing way that he has provided people to help with that work. I think we've had now about 13 teams come just from Northern Ireland alone who have done work on the building and now it can be used for the different ministries there in Moldova. But one of the the funny things about this centre is when we went and we visited it back as a derelict building, we walked through and we thought, you know, this can be used for this and this can be used for this and this, this will be great for this ministry. Do you know, out of all of those plans that we had, there's only one thing happening in that building that we planned. The building is being used for so many different things that we'd never even imagined possible there in Moldova. And it was a real reminder to us as we look back and as we thought about this, you know, we have our plans, but God has better plans than what we have. And, you know, we had ideas for a nursing home and different things, things which, of course, were very much needed. But it turned out that we couldn't do them because of various reasons. But now it's being used for different gospel outreaches and, as I said, things that we never imagined possible to be done in Moldova. So we thank the Lord, you know, for providing for that uh, place, providing that place for his work there. But a lot of the ministry that we're involved in is focused on uh, reaching out to the children with the gospel. And, you know, the reason that we see this work as so important is because Moldova is a very religious country. It's an orthodox country like most of those uh, former Soviet countries. And often when you go and you speak to people, particularly the older generation, and you say, look, I want to tell you about the Lord Jesus, the first thing that they will say to you is, but I'm a Christian. And you say, oh, that's that's good, you know, tell me how you became a Christian. And they say, well, when I was a child, you know, I was baptised in the Orthodox Church. And to them, that, that is what it means to have a relationship with God. And often it's very hard to get past that initial point in conversation with people. But of course, with the children, this younger generation in Moldova, uh, they are so open to learn what the scriptures say and to sing the songs and, and you can teach them, you know, the simple truths of the gospel. And it's so lovely to see this young generation growing up with this knowledge of God's word and then, of course, being able to share it with their parents and even in some cases with their grandparents as well. And so that's why we feel it's so important, you know, to put a lot of emphasis on the work among the children. But this uh, photo that you see on the screen uh, has a little background to it. Um, Back in uh, 2015, we started using the Bethesda Centre, the big building, to do a gospel presentation for children from the schools in the southern region of Moldova. And what we would do is we'd bring the children there, uh, we'd do a presentation which was in various rooms and then we'd have some morning tea or afternoon tea with them and discuss what they had seen and the first year we had about a thousand children came through and then the next year was about two thousand and then uh, in 2019 in May we had a call from the director of education for the southern region of Moldova so he works for the government he's in charge of the education department Uh, His name is Valeru. You might like to pray for this man. And he said, uh, you know, I've heard from my staff, from my teachers, the directors of the school, that you've been taking children to go through this presentation. He said, I'd like to come and see it. And we weren't doing it at that time, but we thought, well, this is important, you know, for this man to see it. So we made a special arrangement for him to come. And then the next day he called back and he said, "Um, I'd like... uh, if it would be possible to bring all the 52 directors of the schools in under my jurisdiction to come through and see the presentation with me. And so, you know, we were very happy that they wanted to come and to see what the children were seeing. So we made a day, they came and they went through the presentation. We took them down to our, our Sydney cafe and the, the ground floor after we had some cakes and some coffee. And Valeria got up and he said to all his staff there, he said, look, You know, we've seen this presentation. We see it's telling children about the Bible. He said, I want to encourage you to enrol all of your children in your schools to come through and see this presentation when it starts next December. And we were so thrilled, you know, to see the education department there wanting the children to learn about the Word of God. 
But of course, this created some difficulties because what it meant was that instead of one or 2,000 children coming through, that potentially there'd be 9,000 children coming through to see the presentation. And so we started making plans and we started, decided to start the program earlier and, you know, to do it every day each week, lots of different sessions because we can only take through about 60 children at a time. We made these arrangements and in 2019 we had a presentation called The Lamb. So in every room there was a story from the Bible which involved a lamb. So, of course, the story of um, Abraham and Isaac, for example, and the Passover was in another room. And then, of course, the idea was to teach the children that the Bible is all about one person, about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who came into this world to take away our sins. And so um, he came, uh, So they came through, and then, of course, COVID came, and we couldn't finish showing all the children the presentation. But what I, why this uh, photo is important, and I, I promise I have a lot of photos, I'll go much quicker than I'm going through this one. <laughs> um, in May 2020... Sorry, in October 2020, Valeru called us and, of course, COVID was starting to decline, which was wonderful. And he said, I'm on my way out to see you. And he said, I have a lady I'd like you to meet. And this lady was the, the uh, vice president of our region. And he said, you know, we've been discussing among ourselves in the education department and also the officials from our region about some of the problems in our community and he said, we have problems with alcohol, we have broken families. He said, we have people fighting with one another. He said, we have problems in the schools with drugs and so on. And he said, we were wondering among ourselves, you know, why are we having these problems? What have we left out? What have we forgotten? And he said, you know, I remembered what I'd seen in the, in the presentations and in our previous discussions. And he said, I said to my colleagues, I think it is because we no longer teach the children in our schools the word of God. And he said, we've come today because we wanted to tell you what we believe is the problem. And he said, we want to organize a meeting with the heads of the education department to see how we can reintroduce the Bible back into the schools here in southern Moldova. Praise God, you know, for such an, an opportunity in that country to be able to do something like that and to hear an official say something like that. So this photo was the day that they came and for about three hours, you can see them all um, lined up there. For about three hours, uh, we sat, we talked with them, we discussed different possibilities and uh, how to get the Bible back into the schools. One of the things that they were very keen to see was the um, recommencement of the summer camps for children and for youth. And we were able to do that starting in June this year. And it was really good to see good numbers of children coming along. About 200 came to each of the five children's camps. Uh, you can see them there. And uh, then we would prepare for the parents uh, a meal on the Friday night. So the camps run Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then on Friday night, the parents would come and we'd have a gospel message for them. We'd have a meal for them. And then, of course, uh, we'd give them literature to take home as well. And you can see some of the groups of children who came to the camps uh, in these pictures. Uh, so it was really great to see lots of children uh, coming along. Um, you can see just a little thank you from some of the team leaders there. The second thing we spoke about was using the Postal Bible School lessons. We use a lot the uh, Bible education services, the Bible time lessons uh, for um, the children who come to our clubs. And so we suggested to the Ministry of Education that these can be used as a curriculum in the school. Uh, and so this is something that they're still working through, they're very keen on, um, but we hope that this will happen soon. But in the meantime, what we decided to do was to ask them whether we could put in the school a post box where children who wanted to do the lessons on a voluntary basis, they could do them and they could post those lessons uh, at, when they'd done the course and we'd come and clear the post boxes. And so every school was happy for this to happen. So it's really lovely to see lots more children studying the word this way. Also, the village Bible clubs, this is something that uh, has been really increasing a lot. And it's lovely to have the opportunity to go out to the schools. So school finishes at three. They give us a room or maybe the auditorium in the school and we can have a Bible club with the children who want to come. And you can see a few photos of those clubs there and also the children taking the lessons as well after the club to do at home. And then, uh, God willing, in September, and we'd really appreciate your prayer for this, 
we're going to start the next presentation for the children where they come to the Bethesda Centre. And the Education Department have agreed for this. And over the course that this will run, we expect about 9,000 children plus teachers to come along. And this year, it's a presentation called Child of the King. And it's based on the life of George Mueller. And particularly uh, tells the story of some of the orphans who were saved in the orphanages in Bristol. And you, we've, we've written a little book which the children can take home. You can see the Russian edition there on the screen. And this is a photo from 2019. But you can see this is some of the children and some of the actors who present this story to the children. And some of the rooms, um, probably it's a little bit hard to guess what this is, but this is actually one of the stories that we'll tell uh, from the life of George Mueller. Uh, you might remember the story when he was on a ship coming back, I think, to the UK, and he had a speaking engagement to share the gospel somewhere. And this great fog came, and the ship couldn't go anywhere. And he said to the captain, you know, I've never missed a, an engagement to speak to share the gospel before. And the captain said, sorry, you know, we can't do anything about it, we just have to wait here. And George, said, I'm, George Mueller said, I'm going down to pray. And the captain went down with him to the cabin... And uh, George Mueller prayed that the fog would clear. And then the captain started to pray. And George Mueller said to the captain, look, don't pray. And the captain said, why? He said, well, firstly, you don't believe God will answer the prayer. And secondly, he said, I believe God already has. And they went up on deck and the fog had gone. And he got to the place where he was going to share the gospel. And why we want to share these stories with the children is of course, to demonstrate to them, you know, God is real. God is there. God answers prayer. And, uh, and of course, first we want them to understand that they need the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. So please pray for those children who are coming, going to come through and to hear the gospel with the uh, Christmas uh, presentation. I think I shared with you last time one of the unusual um, areas of the ministry is the fire service that we run in Moldova. And uh, when we went to Moldova back in 2011, 2010, you know, this was not really something that we ever thought we'd get involved in. Uh, but after different things happening, we ended up taking some fire trucks to Moldova. And then we found there was nobody really to operate them. And we started with some of the workers involved in the work, a fire service in the community. And uh, it's been a really busy this year. Unfortunately, Moldova's been blighted by drought. Everything is very dry, and so this year the team has been out, I think, about 75 calls, which is a lot, you know, for us. But why I share this today is, uh, you know, what God has shown us in Moldova, sometimes you have to think a little bit outside the ordinary uh, for opportunities. And, you know, through this, what has been so amazing is how God has used it to open so many doors in the community in different places, places that probably normally we would not have had access to. So, for example, with the government fire service. And, you know, as we started the fire service, we spoke to them, of course, and we got their permission. And then we had to be rooted into their call centre and we got to know people in the fire service. But through this, the opportunity opened up to start to visit all the fire stations in the country to share the gospel and to print gospel calendars. You can see the 2022 edition of the firefighters calendar. And we give these to all the firefighters in Moldova, along last year with a, a cup with some gospel verses on it. And it's just uh, amazing how God has used this to open doors of opportunity. You can see a photo here. This is in Kishino, the capital, at the central fire station. And we went there with these gift bags with calendars and literature and also gifts for the children of the firefighters. And it was the opportunity to share the gospel with uh, some of these firemen. So it's, uh, it's lovely how... You know, these different opportunities have opened up through this. And we had a funny experience uh, last year in, in December because we were distributing to all the fire stations. And we've got to know Arthur, who is the uh, chief of police for our region, very well. And he came along and we've been sharing the gospel with him. We actually brought him to England uh, earlier this year to help load a container, just to have opportunity to speak to him a little bit, uh, a little bit about the, the gospel, of course, and anyway, uh, he saw us giving these bags to the firefighters and he saw these calendars for the firefighters and he said, you know, you do this for the firefighters. He said, why don't you do it for the police as well? 
And uh, we thought, well, you know, this is a bit of a challenge because, you know, there's 4,000 firefighters and about 12,000 police in Moldova. But anyway, the Lord opened up the way and this year for the first time there'll be a gospel calendar for the police in Moldova. So, you know, please pray for that written word which is being distributed in that country because, you know, we obviously Christian people who are working there can't go everywhere. But the word of God... There it is in the police stations, fire stations, other places. We know that God can use his word. His word is powerful. And so please pray uh, that there'll be much fruit from the distribution of that literature. Um, before I speak a little bit about Ukraine, I just wanted to share about the Christmas festival. Again, you know, as a prayer point. Um, in 2019, of course, I mentioned we couldn't do the gospel outreach we couldn't finish the gospel outreach to the children because of COVID, uh, 2020 rather. Um, at the end of 2020, you know, we were wondering what we should do because normally Christmas pe period was a very busy time for us and uh, we were thinking, you know, it's a shame to lose this opportunity to reach people. And so the idea came up to have a Christmas festival because the law allowed us to do outdoor events, I think probably very similar to here in Northern Ireland. And so we decided in the month of December 2020 to have a Christmas festival and we'd do it outside the uh, Bethesda Centre. And so we made all the arrangements, we planned everything, we bought all the things we needed, set everything up and then the day before it was to begin, <coughs> what happened was they declared a state of emergency and we couldn't go ahead with the festival. So it was a little bit disappointing, of course, for everybody. But anyway, in 2021... We thought, well, you know, it's a good idea for this period of time. And we decided to, to do it again. And, of course, last year it was much freer and the festival was able to go ahead. You can see a few photos here of the festival. Um, this is the literature tent, which was sort of the, the central place where people could come and they could take calendars, they could take Bibles, gospel literature. And, of course, there was the opportunity to speak to them and if they wanted to have a little bit more in-depth conversation, and praise God, many did, we were able to then take them inside and you know, sit down more quietly with them and, and speak to them. Um, but it was really lovely because we, we didn't know what sort of response there would be from the community. And the first day, you know, about 100 people came and then 200, and most of them were from our village and from our area. But as the days went on, getting closer to, to Christmas, the numbers went up. And sort of towards the end, there was about 1,000 people coming. And the last day was about 1,200 people. And in total, about 7,500 people came through the festival. And it was just lovely to have this opportunity to meet people, again, many of them, who we had never, uh, from areas we'd never been to or never met before. And you can see here some of the families and the children. And every hour, uh, on the hour, we had a gospel presentation uh, uh, here in this like centre stage area where people could come and they could hear the message of the gospel presented. Um, so it was really great to see people coming and uh, hearing that as well. Uh, so there was games, there was activities, there was free food, of course, for people. And uh, we're really looking forward to doing the same uh, again in December this year. So please pray for that outreach as well. Uh, in the community there in Moldova. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the situation with Ukraine. Uh, this map you see here on the screen, uh, you've probably seen similar ones in the newspapers here, or on the news here rather. Um, this one was probably done quite some time ago because the numbers have increased a lot since then. But since the beginning of the conflict, uh, about 600,000 refugees have come into Moldova. Now, as I said at the beginning, a population of about 2.2 million people and 600,000 people coming in, uh, it really has had a huge impact, as you can imagine, on a country like Moldova, which is, a, you know, as I said, a very poor country. When we first heard about the war, um, in a very short time, we had some calls from the fire service, because they were obviously very active in in providing help to refugees who were coming into the country. And they asked us if we could go to the borders and take food and water and other things that these people might need. So you can see a photo here. This is at the southern border of Moldova. Uh, Georgia Lesht, it's called. And a lot of people were coming across there uh, through Moldova and then, of course, to go on into Romania and the European Union. 
And, you know, sometimes people just need a transport, like you can see here in this picture. <coughs> but other times, you know, there were some really sad situations with people coming across. Uh, this was one very cold night. It was about 11 o'clock. It was snowing. And that bus was filled with mothers with children. And we went there. We saw the people. And, you know, it was so sad to see the, uh, to hear and to see the situation of these people, many of them you couldn't really speak to because they were so much in shock by what they had seen. And others who came, uh, this is a little boy who's actually living very close to us in, in Zanesh now with his family. His name is Misha. And when he first came with his family, uh, we saw that his face was all badly scratched. And we, we said, you know, why? we asked his mother why this was. And she said, in the two weeks prior to coming, the area where they came from was being attacked by missiles all the time. And he said they were living in a cellar and Misha was, you know, so frightened that he was doing this, scratching his face, you know, just out of anxiety and fear. And, of course, now it's lovely to see him. He's really fitted in around the base there and a uh, totally different situation. But you can imagine, uh, you know, what so many of these people that have been affected by this conflict have, have seen. This is at the border... And, of course, we couldn't be there all the time. We don't have enough people to do that. But what we did was prepare our bags for the refugees coming in. This was in the very early days, of course, with hygiene items and some other things, also some literature as well in Russian. Because most of the refugees coming to our part of the country spoke Russian, not Ukrainian, because they were from southern uh, Ukraine. And so Jan, who we know in the immigration department, you can see him there on the right, uh, he was there almost all the time. And he said, look, give me the bags. He said, I'll give these out to the people when they come. And so it was really great to have officials there from the government giving out this practical help, but also the gospel literature as well. And you can see here, these were some of the activity packs that we prepared for the children, because a lot of them spent a lot of time waiting, 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 of course, at the borders. Actually, that day you saw the bus there in that previous picture. There was a, a, a queue of cars about 14 kilometres long, at that border waiting to come in to uh, Moldova. Then the government uh, contacted us and they said, you know, the, the, we need food, we need meals for the people. Um, they had people staying in government accommodation in the uh, university in our area and also in the uh, sanatorium and they needed to feed these people. So we started providing about 200 to 250 hot meals a day for those who were staying in those places and you can see them doing that in the kitchen. So we'd take it every day uh, in hot boxes, deliver it there. But, you know, it was so wonderful that, you know, God gave that opportunity because we could go there uh, every day. Different workers would go. We could speak to the people. And, you know, many of them are very open to talk. Um, you know, they'd share their stories, of course, and then we'd have the opportunity to share about the Lord. Uh, you can see Lucy there, one of the workers um, from Australia, now living in the UK, is shortly coming with her husband back to Moldova to live uh, full-time, and uh, we'd give the food, we'd give literature, then we were able to organise some activities for the children, and uh, in June, we were able to bring all the children from the, these places to a children's camp, which was conducted in Russian, especially for them, so that was a really lovely opportunity. And of course, one of the things that really impressed us so much in Moldova was, you know, being such a poor country, how much compassion and how much help the Moldovan people you know, we're ready to give to those coming in to Moldova. And, of course, a lot of the Christians got involved in different activities throughout the country, and so they started contacting, saying, look, we need bedding, we need pillows, we need sheets, we need mattresses, and so we had some in stock which were able to provide and, and send out to different places. And, of course, again, with the officials as well, it was the same situation in the first four or five weeks because it took some time for, you know, the big aid to come, from EU and other places. So in that time, we were able to provide some of the practical help that was uh, needed, um, like you can see here, food and hygiene items, and this was delivered to different parts of the country. Um, then uh, we started working very closely with Christians in uh, Kishino in the capital, and what they set up was there, uh, set up there was a drop-in centre for refugees. So once a week, one representative of each family could come and get the food and the help that they needed uh, for that following week. 
And so uh, they needed, of course, to be able to run this place. They needed food, they needed clothing, they needed uh, different items. So some of it we bought, some of it we sent uh, from the containers that had come in from Scotland, from England, from Northern Ireland and other places. And you can see that being delivered here and some of the refugee children and families uh, receiving that help. Um, so those sort of things we continue to do. Um, but what, what happened, you know, uh, in April was um, you know, very interesting because there was obviously a lot of needs in Moldova itself. But then this brother here on the uh, left of the photo, his name is Petru, contacted us. And Petru is actually from Odessa, Ukraine. Uh, he lived there with his family. The night after the war began, he came to us to stay in Moldova. And then he went on to Romania where he settled his family and he started a ministry of taking aid into Ukraine to help needy families, and particularly Christian families in the areas most affected by the conflict. And so he contacted us and he said, look, we really, really need help in Ukraine. Uh, is there any possibility to get food, to get clothing, to get these things that we need? And he said, firstly, you know, could you come and visit us? So we went to Odessa. You can see this was arriving in the city of Odessa. And he'd organised a meeting with some of the people who were involved in distributing the aid to different parts of the country. And you can see them here uh, in this picture. And he explained to us, you know, what the situation was in different places and particularly those areas where they'd been fighting and where the uh, Russian forces had withdrawn from. You know, there was tremendous needs among people in those areas. And, of course, he shared some of the photos of the devastation and the destruction which, of course, was very terrible to see. But he said, you know, one of the biggest needs at the moment in Ukraine is with the refugees within the country because there was many what they call internally displaced people and they come from the war areas where there was active fighting to safer parts of the country. And you can see some photos of some of those people there. And so as a result of this, we started um, taking aid into, uh, into Ukraine uh, from Moldova and also from Romania, we have a warehouse in Galatz, which is very close to the uh, Ukrainian border. Uh, we take it first to Odessa. You can see that highlighted in the south. And then aid would go to uh, Mikhailov, um, also to Zaporozhna, which is over there, um, up to Kharkov, which is sort of an area which is still being bombarded today. And, of course, around Kiev, where there'd been a lot of fighting as well. And other smaller villages, of course, in between. And we just so thank the Lord, you know, for the way that he has provided. Um, aid has come, a lot of aid has come in. Uh, so far, I think about 170 tonnes of aid has been distributed um, through, you know, these different channels, which I'll share about in a moment. But food came from Northern Ireland, food came from Scotland, and the generosity of the Lord's people has just been so amazing to see. So it would first go to Galatz, as I said, in Romania, uh, sometimes then Ukrainian drivers would come, Christian people in their vans. You can see them there. We'd load the vans. Uh, then we'd, um, they'd go back and they'd distribute it. Sometimes bigger trucks would come. But uh, probably the most effective way that we found to help with the need was actually to go to Ukraine itself uh, and buy food within the country. And this is a photo taken at Metro in Odessa. And, you know, often uh, a lot of food was available still in that area of Ukraine, maybe not other parts. It was a little bit more expensive, of course, than it was in other places, but the advantage was that there was no logistics, there was no customs problems. Uh, it was available immediately. We could straight away uh, load it into the vans that were waiting there. You can see some of the, the brothers there who are involved in driving these vans, and it could go out and it could be distributed to the areas of need uh, in that country. Um, and so this is something that we still do. So usually we go uh, every three or four weeks, buy about 15,000 pounds worth of food. It's loaded straight into the vans and then it goes out and is distributed in the areas very close to the front line. You can see a few photos here of some of those who have received help. And also not only just to families, but to some of the Christian uh, organisations or churches mainly who are doing work among the refugees so this photo is taken in Odessa and this church in the centre of Odessa, they provide about 300 meals a day to refugees who have come from the other part of the country and they give these hot meals and of course they need food and supplies to be able to run that work. 
And uh, so we, we really thank the Lord, you know, for the support. I know many here have supported as well to enable this help to be given uh, be, uh, in the result, as a result of the conflict in Ukraine. But I just wanted to share with you one other thing about Ukraine, um, which was so encouraging for us. You know, our heart is for the gospel, of course, to share the gospel in these places. And we know that God can use a terrible situation, a conflict like this, firstly to soften hearts and to make people more open, but also to just give new opportunities for the gospel. And when we went to meet these men uh, who were involved in distribution, that previous photo I showed you a little way back, there was a man there who was a deputy in the Ukrainian parliament, and he was also a Christian. And he came up after, uh, just as we were about to leave, and he said, look, I, I have uh, a request. We thought he was going to ask for money or you know, something like this. That's what mainly people are requesting. He said, I don't know if you can do it, he said, but I have a lot of contact in the military. I go to the soldiers on the front line. And he said, I'd love to be able to take uh, the gospel with me, the word of God with me to give to these soldiers. Can you get us Gospels of John or some other New Testaments, whatever, in Russian that I can give to these soldiers? And he said, I'd like 100,000 if it was possible. And so you can see a photo of him. He's the man at the centre there uh, with the soldiers at the front line. So just at that very time, uh, we were about to come to Northern Ireland and I've been talking to Michael Hewitt who works with us here in Northern Ireland and he'd been in contact with Revival Movement and they'd made an offer of 100,000 Gospels of John. And so we were able to go there and take receipt of them. You can see that. We loaded them onto one of the lorries that was going with food and then they went to Romania and then from Romania we took them into Ukraine and now they're being distributed among the soldiers there in Ukraine and others as well, of course. And praise God, since then, uh, another 70,000 have gone just this week. They'll be loaded in a container and be going across. So please pray, you know, that through this, uh, many, many people will come to know the Lord Jesus as their saviour. And just as I close the report, I wanted to share with you um, a couple of photos. Uh, this is an amazing photo, I think, considering the situation, because in the middle is Brother Sergei, and Brother Sergei is from Russia, and we've worked with Sergei for many years, and the two girls with him are from Ukraine. And this photo was taken about five weeks ago, and it was the day that these two girls, and they, they came uh, back in March, just after the war commenced, to stay with us. They were looking for accommodation. The Moldovan government contacted us and said, can you accommodate a family? And at that time, we had about 40, 50 people staying, and we said, yeah, we can have these family. So these two girls, their mother and their little brother came. And anyway, they arrived and we started talking to them a little bit, you know, but there was a lot of people there, occasionally over a meal. But then back in June, uh, no, Ju uh, May, uh, they started coming on Sunday when we had a church service there in the village. And they started coming to some of the Bible studies. And then they asked for a Bible. And they started going to the girls club that we have in, in the village. And you could see that they were taking an interest in spiritual things. And anyway, then Sergei came with Irina, his wife, to run the camp for the Ukrainian children. And he started talking to them and sharing his testimony. And on this day, um, about a week after Sergei came, we were just about to go out uh, to some villages and they came and said, we want to talk to you, we've got something really important to talk about. We said, look, just wait till we get back. We, you know, we have to go. We're running late, as we usually are. Um, it's, you know, can you wait? And they said, no, we need to tell you now. And we said, what, what do you want to say? They said, last night we accepted the Lord Jesus, both of them, as our saviour. And 18 years old, twins, these two girls are. And it was just so wonderful to see how God had worked in their life. And I was reminded of that beautiful verse. Uh, actually, I read it at their baptism um, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, and it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that's what happened in the lives of these two girls. So please pray for them. Uh, pray for their mother, Olga. She also took a lot of interest as well. And then just in the last week before they left to go back to Ukraine, um, their father, Petru, came as well and they had the opportunity to speak to him. Not so much interest as yet, but pray 
that that family all will come to know the Lord Jesus. And one of the girls came up just before they left and they said something very unusual, but you can understand what they, what they mean. We thank God that this war brought us to Moldova. They said, when we left Moldova, we were so shocked, we were horrified by what was going on. We thought it was such a terrible thing. We said, why did God allow it? But now we know that God used it to bring us to know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour. So before they left, and this is the, another amazing part to the story, uh, they came and they said, we've been reading in the Bible about Philip and this eunuch, and we saw that uh, Philip, the eunuch wanted to be baptised. And we want to be baptised because we want to obey what the Lord says, uh, you know, to be baptised. And so they came and they, we said, look, you know, we, we will be able to do it before you leave. And they said, please, can we get baptised while Sergei and Irina, this is from Russia, are there? Um, because she said, one of the girls said, you know, Sergei is like a dad to us. Isn't that amazing, yeah? That Russians, Ukraine, these things don't matter in the Lord, yeah? and how God had taken away all those barriers and transformed the lives of these people. And so this was the day, and you can see Sergei there uh, baptising one of the girls. So praise God for what he does in the lives of people. Uh, just a few photos. This is the Sunday school uh, we have in the village there, and it's really lovely to see lots of children coming along. Uh, this is the ladies from our village. So on the 1st of May, we had a, a ladies' uh, morning tea and had the opportunity to bring them and to share the gospel with them. It was really good to see lots coming along. Um, this is another lady, Zena, from the village, the day that she was baptised. And why I like showing this picture is because the man on the right there, his name is Valeru, and he got saved about four years ago, along with his wife. They're both um, ambulance medics. And uh, it's so wonderful when you see the local believers who have been saved going on, sharing the gospel with others, and now here baptising a new believer. So praise God for his work in their lives. This is two men, and I just wanted to show this photo because I know many of you get our WhatsApp prayer points and have been praying. We're praying for two men, Valeru and uh, Oleg. And their two wives got saved about three years ago, and they desperately wanted to see their husbands to come to know the Lord Jesus. And this year, both of them got saved. And this was the day that uh, they were baptised. It's the two men there in the middle. Um, this is uh, another photo of um, Vasily and Akalina from neighbouring village. Uh, Vasily is uh, one of our maintenance workers. Akalina works in the kitchen and she um, got saved about 18 months ago. And she wanted Vasily, of course, her husband, to be saved. And about five weeks back, he came one day after the uh, service on Sunday afternoon. He said, I want to accept the Lord Jesus as my saviour and today i'm sorry i'm not there for this but today he's being baptized so please pray for vasily um, just a few prayer points you know pray for moldova i told you that there's such wonderful open doors there at the present time and we pray that these doors will remain open and that country will be open to the message of the gospel so please pray for that pray for the economic situation look i know things are very bad everywhere um, in Moldova, things are very difficult as well. Uh, the, last year, there was a drought. This year, they believe they will lose 80% of the harvest because there's been no rain at all this year. And also, Moldova receives about 92% of its grain and, and um, cereal from Ukraine, and none of it's coming at the moment. So there's a really desperate situation. And then if you add to that the problems that we have here with gas and electricity prices... Um, this time last year, gas was four lay, which is uh, well, you know, four lay per cubic metre. This year, it's 37 lay per cubic metre. So people are really worried how they're going to be able to heat their homes this winter. So please pray for the situation there and for wisdom, you know, to how to help with the various needs. Pray for stability as well. You know, in a situation like there is in Ukraine next door, uh, you know, there's always the possibility that it can bring instability in neighbouring countries. But pray for, you know, godly people to be in leadership and wisdom to react in the right way in the situation there. So please pray for Moldova. Pray for the school teachers. You know, we thank the Lord that the door is open into the schools, but pray not only the students, but the teachers will come to know the Lord Jesus as well because it would be so wonderful to have teachers in the schools there who believe the Bible, who teach the Bible to the children. 
And this is a Bible study we had last year for school teachers from our village. And it's been uh, lovely to have that opportunity. And we pray that this will resume uh, soon. Pray for the outreach to the children, which is planned, as I said, starting in September, um, this, coming, uh, this coming September. Pray for the, uh, the, ch- the youth camps. Uh, we finished one just yesterday. Uh, in a week's time, we start the next youth camp. And, you know, we were really so encouraged when um, this man on the left here, he's now a, a firefighter, he came to us at the Christmas festival and he said, you remember me? And to be honest, I couldn't remember him. And I said, no, sorry, but, you know, tell me who you are. And he said, I came to one of your youth camps about seven years ago. And he said, I still remember the things that I learned at the camp. And he recited some of the Bible verses. He's not a Christian as yet, but we know that God can use that seed which is sown in years to come. So please pray for the work among the children and youth. Pray for this lady here um, on the right. So this is Ruth, my wife on the left, and Sevastina on the right. She's from our village. Uh, She was a teacher in the school. She went to the Bible study last year. And then she started coming to the assembly, the church on Sunday. And she got saved last year. And we're able to baptise her on Christmas Day. But uh, her husband is an alcoholic and often beats her, and she has a very difficult life. Uh, and she'd love to see him come to know the Lord Jesus. So maybe you can remember to pray for her husband. And for the refugees, of course, I've already mentioned, that have come and that have stayed, that have heard the gospel. This was um, Allah who came very early on and took a lot of interest in the gospel. And also for this young man, Andre. Um, Andre was one of our little Sunday school boys many years ago. You can see that in the inset there. And last year in May, he came back. We hadn't seen him for many years. And he said, look, I want a job. I'm a cook. Can, do you have any work? So after consideration, we decided to take him on as a cook in the kitchen. And now he works with us. And after being with us for about a, a month or so, he came one day and he said, do you know why I wanted to come back? And we said, no, we probably to get some money. And he said, no, he said, because I remember the things that I learned at Sunday school and at camp. And he said, I I want to know, I want to learn more about those things. So pray for his salvation as well. And for the team of workers there. So there's about 50 full-time workers involved in the ministry. Uh, Most are from Moldova. uh, Some from UK, of course, and Australia. uh, Romania, Armenia, Russia. Uh, So please pray for the team there as well. And again, you know, thank you so much for your prayers for the work and for the support for the ministry there. And as I said at the beginning, we just thank the Lord, you know, for the privilege that he has given us to be involved in what he is doing in that little country of Moldova and pray uh, for the work of the gospel there and that many will be saved. And I just mentioned we have a WhatsApp prayer group. I know many of you are already part of it. If you'd like to be part, uh, I can add you or you can scan that QR code there on the screen. Um, And there's also some prayer cards and a sign-up sheet out there if you'd like to to do that. I know time is going, so I'm going to just uh, refer to this passage for a few moments just to share a few thoughts with you. Uh, I have to say, you know, um, probably we all have our favourite stories from the Bible, and maybe some of us have many favourite stories, and this is one of my favourites, this story of uh, the storm that was on the Sea of Galilee. And um, why I just wanted to share it with you today was that um, as I think of this story and uh, why I um, thought of it, I think was I was actually going to speak about something else. I was just thinking as we were singing that song, Christ is the centre of all. And it reminded me of this beautiful story that we read about here. You know, Matthew 14 to me is one of those passages of scripture which is full of contrast. You know, you start off in the passage and there's this terrible event takes place where the disciples of John the Baptist witnessed the murder of John the Baptist. Then you have this remarkable event which follows where the Lord feeds the 5,000, miraculously feeds this enormous group of people. And then, of course, you go on to the next event in the chapter where the Lord walks on the water and the disciples find themselves in the middle of this storm. And, you know, I, I often like to think as I'm looking at a passage or studying a passage, you know, what would it have been like for those disciples to be in that situation. And, you know, obviously at the beginning, you know, when the Lord told them to get into this boat and to go over to the other side, and he said, you know, I'm going to come over after, but you go on this journey, go to the other side. 
I imagine after seeing all the things that they had seen that day with the Lord feeding these 5,000 people, they would have been exhilarated, they would have been filled with joy and they probably would have thought this is going to be the best trip we've ever had across this sea. The Lord has sent us. We're going across uh, at his command. But that's not how it worked out, was it? It was a very different situation to perhaps what they imagined because what happened was as they set out in this little boat and they found themselves in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, they found that this great storm came and they were tossed up and down and the wind was against them and they couldn't go anywhere and they were frightened even for their very lives. And, you know, if you've been there and probably many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee, you'll look at it and you'll, you'll say, you know, I wonder how this could really happen because it seems such a calm sea, doesn't it? It's like a, a mill pond most of the time. But I was, uh, as I said, um, Michael Hewitt, he works a lot with us and he was showing me a video uh, just the other day from when he was there earlier this year and there was a storm on the Sea of Galilee and you should have seen the waves and you can imagine what it was like for these disciples in the middle of the sea. But anyway, the first thing we notice we see this, that the Lord sends them. The next thing that we see is that the Lord sends the multitudes away. And then we see that it tells us in verse 23 that the Lord went up on the mountaintop to pray. And it was during this time that he was alone on the mountaintop that it tells us that that boat that those disciples were in, they were in the middle of the sea and they were tossed, it says, up and down because the wind was contrary. You know, as I think about this lovely story and we see how the Lord comes in and he intervenes in the situation, you know, it reminds me so much of what our lives can be like sometimes as Christians. You know, sometimes when we have a new believer in Moldova, um, they come to us after a little while and they say, you know, after I got saved, I was so filled with joy and happiness. I thought everything was going to be so good for the rest of my life. But you know, they say, these problems are starting to arise. These tribulations are starting to come. These difficulties are coming into my life. What should I do in this situation? And for thus, us of us here today who have been Christians for a long period of time, or a longer period of time, we know that it's true, isn't it? That after we get saved, it doesn't always mean that all the problems go away. Sometimes God allows difficulties, problems, tribulations, trials to come into our life to train us, perhaps, or to make us the people that he wants us to be. And this was exactly what happened here in the life of these disciples, I believe. The Lord sent them off in this boat. He, sought, he sent them into a storm. What for? So that they could learn something about him and the greatness of who he was and also how that he could be the solution to every problem that could come into their lives. The Lord Jesus, the centre of it all. That was really the lesson that they had to learn that day. So we note that the Lord sent them into this situation and then he went up onto the mountaintop to pray. You know, I think this is a really beautiful picture as well for us because one of the great encouragements that I find in my Christian life, you know, sometimes when there's difficulties and we're struggling with problems or maybe there's a sin in our lives that we're trying to be victorious over, whatever it might be, isn't it wonderful to know that we have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Where is he? It says that he's up in heaven, he's there. And what does it tell us that he is doing in the word of God? It says that he constantly lives to uh, intercede on behalf of those who believe. What's he doing now? He is praying for us, isn't he? The great high priest is in heaven. There he is praying for those who believe, interceding on our behalf. And we see the Lord was up there on that mountaintop and he was praying. And I believe he was praying for those disciples in this situation that they would overcome, that they would learn those lessons that they needed to learn that day. But anyway, after they'd been in the middle of that sea for a period of time and we see the boat was tossed up and down, the wind was against them. You know, life can sometimes be like that, can't we? Can't it rather? Sometimes, you know, things seem to be going so well, so smoothly seems that nothing can go wrong and then all of a sudden our life seems to be totally turned upside down. And then other times, you know, in our, in our growth spiritually perhaps, you know, we feel that there is this contrary wind against it. We just can't progress. We don't seem to be going forward as we should. 
And we see a real picture of that here in this story that took place in the life of the disciples. But then it says in verse 25, it came to the fourth watch of the night. Now, if we know uh, about the times that it speaks about here, this tells us that these disciples had been in this situation for a long period of time. The fourth watch of the night, as far as I understand, is, very, is the early hours of the morning. The Lord sent them away in that boat when evening came. So for that period of time, they'd been in the middle of that sea. They hadn't progressed anywhere. The storm had been raging and it was a long period of time to be involved in that, uh, in that battle, you could say. But then the Lord came and he came walking on the sea. You know, we have a beautiful picture here, I think, brothers and sisters, of what the Lord Jesus has done, don't we, for us. You know, we think of the fact that in our circumstances, firstly, our circumstances are away from God. The Bible tells us that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were without hope in this world. There was nothing that we could do to reconcile ourselves to God. But what does it tell us in the Word of God? That the Lord Jesus himself, the Son of God, tells us in Hebrews, the one who upholds everything by the word of his power, the creator of all things. He came, didn't he, into our circumstances. He was born as a babe at Bethlehem. He lived that life, a perfect life, of course, for 30 or so years. And then he died on the cross of Calvary. You know, lovely what it says in Philippians. It describes that work for us, doesn't it? He who made himself of no reputation, who took the form of a servant, humbled himself, and we think of who he was, and he did that in his love for you and me. He came into our circumstances. He came into that great storm of God's judgment that we could never overcome. And as a result, he gave us the victory. He gave us the way out of that storm through that work that he did at Calvary. But also he comes in, I believe, into the storms that come into our life as well. You know, I want to just share a personal story with you that illustrated this to me so well. Uh, many years ago, uh, my mother was un unwell with a type of cancer and, you know, she was okay. You know, she had treatment for some years and she was doing okay. But then uh, after four, four or so years, it started to get worse and the treatment wasn't working. And, you know, for us as a family, you know, that was a real storm, as you can imagine, in our life. And, you know, I remember thinking at that time, as perhaps we often do in such circumstances with illness, you know, where is the Lord in this situation? You know, why has the Lord allowed this? We need her here. And, of course, the result was that she passed away. She went to be with him. And, you know, in the beginning, I could not see the Lord in that situation. And I think these disciples, and we see it in the next passage, um, when they saw the Lord come in, they couldn't recognize, though they'd been with him just a few hours before, they couldn't recognize him in the midst of that storm. So great was the problem that they found themselves in. And sometimes when circumstances come into our life, it is hard for us to see the Lord in that situation. But you know the reality that he teaches us is he's there. He's always there in every situation. And I remember not long before she passed away, you know, the Lord made this very clear to us. I'm in this situation just as I'm in every other situation. I know every detail. And this is my plan. This is my will. This is my purpose for this to be as it is. And the Lord allowed us at that time or, or taught us or helped us then to be able to say, you know, what you want in this situation is what is important and gave us so much peace. In that, But in the beginning, the point that I wanted to draw out, just as these disciples couldn't see the Lord in that storm, so we couldn't see it there, see him there in our situation. But the wonderful thing is the Lord is always there. And it's good for us to know that, isn't it, as his people. And, of course, when they saw him, as I said, they said, is a ghost. They couldn't recognise him. And they cried out for fear. But look what it says in verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Notice something here. The storm didn't stop. There was still a storm. There was still wind. 
There was still the rain, no doubt, and the waves were huge. The storm didn't go away. But what the Lord was telling those disciples of his was the fact of him being there was sufficient for that situation. No need to be afraid. I am here. Do not be afraid. Isn't that a wonderful thing for us to know? That there's nothing in our lives. And I'm not saying that the storms are not very real and very deep, very terrible at times. But there is nothing in our, that can come into our lives as God's people that is greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, than, than him. And that's what we learn, I believe, and God wants us to learn from this lovely story here. And so he says, you don't have to be afraid because I am here. Then he goes on, of course, then it goes on and it says, Peter answered him. You know, it's lovely, isn't it, to read the stories of Peter in the word of God because he has such an impulsive character, isn't he? And he always goes to the other extreme, you could say, in every situation. And he says, well, Lord, if it's you, then you command me to come to you on the water. And, of course, the Lord said to him, come. And this is a, you know, another beautiful lesson I think we learn because Peter was a fisherman, as we all know. And I should imagine if you're a fisherman, I've never been a fisherman, I don't like fishing, but if I was a fisherman, to be able to walk on water would be a very useful thing, wouldn't it, to be able to do that if you're a fisherman? You, know, you wouldn't need a boat, you could just drag the net along as you walked on the water. Peter knew as a fisherman that that was an impossible thing to do, to walk on the water. But he also knew who the Lord was. And he knew that with the Lord, the impossible was possible. And I think what this tells us, brothers and sisters, is that with the Lord Jesus, the life that we are called to live is not the natural life, is it? It's a supernatural life. Supernatural not because of us or because of any strength in ourselves or because the goodness of us, but the one that we serve and the one that our power comes from is not here, but is above. And God wants us to look to him for the strength to live every day. And that's not a natural strength, is it? That's a supernatural strength that comes through, of course, uh, through the power of the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. And so Peter believed that he could do something which was impossible to do if the Lord called him to do it. And the Lord says, come. And Peter came down out of the boat, it says, and what did he do? He did the impossible. He walked on the water and he says he did that to go to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Lord Jesus. But then in verse 30, situation changes and you know how often this can happen to us. You know, we make that first step of faith, trusting, looking at the Lord. But then we look around us and we see. And I can imagine Peter as he got out of that boat, he was looking at the Lord and the wind and the waves were irrelevant to him. But then all of a sudden, perhaps out of the corner of his eye, he saw that great wave, you know, coming across or maybe felt the strength of the wind. And he thought, what am I doing out of this boat? You know, this is foolish to get out of that boat and be walking on the water. And he took his eyes off the Lord. And what happened? He started to sink in that situation. And how often, you know, that can happen in our lives as well. When we're going through those trials or those tribulations, whatever it might be, we take our eyes off the Lord. And then we get overcome, don't we, by the situation. But it's lovely what the Lord says. It says immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and he said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He reminded him of the previous words. You have no need to be afraid. It is me. I'm here. There's no need to be afraid. And it says, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So, you know, I love this story because I find it such, uh, so many practical lessons for us in our lives as, as we go on here in, in this world. You know, problems will come. Storms will come in life. But it's wonderful to know, isn't it, that we have a saviour, the great high priest who is in heaven today and he ever lives to intercede on behalf of those who believe. And I believe the lesson that the disciples learnt was that there was no storm too great for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, in our lives, though we might find it hard to believe it at times, it is the same. There's no storm, there's no problem, no difficulty, which is too great for the Lord Jesus Christ. The lesson is, I think, that I got from this passage as I read it, 
you know, as we go through life, there's two ways that we can be. There'll be storms and there's us. Is the Lord between us and the storm or is the storm between us and the Lord? If the storm is between us and the Lord, we will be like Peter, we'll sink, won't we? We won't be able to overcome. The circumstances will overwhelm us. But may God help us as his people to realise that he is so great, so powerful, that we keep our eyes fixed upon him. And though the ways might be very real, and they will be at times, he will give us the strength to overcome. May God help us to keep our eyes on him and may, be, may he be the centre of all to us. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. It's amazing what God's doing in Moldova. Let's continue to pray for Matthew and the work out there. I just want to pray uh, as we go and just pray that God will bless you as you go into another week. Yeah, Father, we just thank you for this morning and we thank you for your presence. We thank you for, Lord, what you're doing in Moldova. We thank you, Father, for lives that are being touched, O oh God, and lives are being changed, O oh God. And we thank you for those open doors and we pray that those open doors will remain open, O oh God. And you'll open more doors, O oh God, and you will, O oh God, expand your work, Lord, there. So, Lord, we pray your blessing over Matthew. We pray your protection, even as he travels today, that you will be with him and undertake for him. And, Father, we thank you for that opportunity, Lord, to just to listen to your word again. And, Father, just to be re reminded, O oh God, that, Lord, no matter what comes our way, that, Lord, you are the center of our lives. And that, Father, you will, O oh God, minister to us that you will encourage us and you would lead us, Lord, even as we go into another week, that, Father, you will, O God, go before us, lead us, O God, guide us, O God, and no matter what comes our way, that you will enable us, Lord, to have faith and confidence in you, that, Lord, we are able to overcome even in these days. So, Father, bless us this week. Undertake, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.